Tonight we're going to be led by the Star Spangled Banner by Mr. Helmuth. Please rise. Thank you very much, Ms. Thomas. <laughs> oh, I just broke my thing. Uh, Sean, I broke your microphone. Um, good evening. Good evening. Tonight we're going to start with the special town meeting, finish that up, and then go back into the regular town meeting. One of the members asked me how many articles we have left. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. We have 18 articles left once we finish the special. So there's only one left on that. Uh, are there any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? Seeing none. Um, Ms. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved that if the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, May 16th, 2016 at 8 p.m. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, it carries. Okay, test question. Get your clickers. We all said over there, oh, that's not Mr. Lathwood. Did I forget your name? I'm sorry. Mike. Mike, oh, like the other Mike. Okay, Mike, whenever you're ready, the question is, only Americans of Soviet have walked on the moon. One for yes, two for no. So only Americans and Soviets have walked on the moon. One for yes, two for no. Uh, no, correct. Only Americans, 12 Americans have walked in the moon between 1969 and 1972. So check your clicker, make sure it's correct. So 49 people are going back to school for geography and history. Eight, no, okay. Um, any announcements, Ms. Brazil? You don't want to give your announcement now. Oh, you have a report. I'm sorry. Any announcements, Ms. Mahan? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Diane Mahan, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. What I'd like to do is give 20 seconds of an announcement and then call up Greg Christiana. As you all are aware, the Board of Selectmen voted to put a debt exclusion on June 14th um, regarding our growing enrollment and how to address that. Myself, as Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, Jennifer Seuss, as Chairman of the School Committee, and Steve DeCourcy, if I could ask Steve to come up here, um, and here's Dr. Seuss, uh, will be chairing the effort, and I'd like to ask 
Greg Cristiani to give some very brief remarks on that. Hi, thank you, Diane. Uh, I'm Greg Cristiano from Precinct 15. Uh, I am uh, a manager of the Build Arlington's Future campaign, which was launched to support the debt exclusions we'll vote on as a town on June 14th. I'm proud to be standing up here with the three chairs of this campaign uh, who kindly introduced me. Uh, thank you all for your, the three of you for your leadership uh, in this campaign and in our town's government. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge the other people in this room who have volunteered their time to work on this campaign. If you're a campaign volunteer, uh, will you please stand up briefly right now to identify yourselves? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all. As of today, we have 265 volunteers, uh, and it's growing every day. Uh, each of the three questions on the ballot represent uh, an important piece of the long-term plan developed by the town to address enrollment growth and the facilities needs at every level of our public school system. The Board of Selectmen voted unanimously to place these questions on the ballot because these debt exclusions are essential to the future of our schools and our town. You should have a yellow fact sheet on your chair with more details about the debt exclusions and the campaign. If you did not stand up, I urge you to go to our website, buildarlingtonsfuture.org, where you can volunteer, donate, or add your name to the list of supporters. And I invite you all to come to the Build Arlington's Future campaign rally this Sunday, May 15th, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Arlington Masonic Temple at 19 Academy Street. All are welcome. Diane and Jennifer will both be there speaking, and you'll have a chance to learn more about the debt exclusions and the campaign. Most importantly, we will have refreshments. I hope to see you all there, uh, or as many of you who can make it. Uh, we believe that together, as a community, we can build Arlington's future. Thank you. Thank you. Any other reports of committees, or report, no, excuse me, announcements? Mr. Jameson, then Mr. Hainer. Jameson first, then Hainer. Jameson, then Hainer. He's getting in the, he's getting in the, in the uh, standby box. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12, and in this capacity, uh, co-chair of the Arlington Recycling Committee. Um, first of all, I want to thank the, uh, the body for, I want to thank the body for, um, Gordon Jameson for the Recycling Committee. I want to thank the body for attending to our waste into the recycling bins during the meeting. You've all been very cooperative, and I want to thank you for that, as does the staff of the uh, town. Um, Next, uh, as those are who are longtime members, uh, in this, every spring I come up and remind you that the Community Collection Day that everyone loves is this Saturday between 9 and 1 at the town yard. Don't come early, don't come late. There's, lots of, there's a small flyer in the back that you can read more on, and for the folks at the home, there's information on the website. Next, do not confuse Community Collection Day with Household Hazardous Waste Day, which is in Lexington, also on Saturday. Bring your hazard, household hazard waste to Lexington, not to Arlington. Bring your community collection stuff to Arlington, not to Lexington. Next, we also have a, a, a smaller version of Collection Day. And uh, in the lobby is Charlotte Milan, the recycling coordinator. And she can help you learn more about that. There's also information on here. So you can actually do this every month. A big hit there is styrofoam. Uh, you might be have noticed in the paper, if you're an advocate subscriber online or in print version that we have launched a series of recycling right articles for look for those to continue continue through the summer uh, we also have launched a community compost or neighborhood share shared composting uh, initiative and this initiative if two or more families band together and say that they'll share a bin the recycling committee will give you the bin for free and lastly, that's, I want to thank everyone for helping to make Arlington a high recycling community. And Charlotte's in the lobby at halftime to give you more information about those two events. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bill Hanna, Precinct 2. Uh, I have two announcements. One, uh, the Arlington uh, Rotary would like to invite members here and the community to their annual Paul Harris uh, dinner. It will be on uh, uh, June 13th at the Sons of Italy, and we are honoring 
uh, Richard Duffy and Anthony Carson for the Paul Harris Award, and for Community Service uh, Award will be Lauren Ledger, Susan Stewart, Vicki Rose, and Nicole Melnick. Second announcement I would like to make as a member of the uh, Veterans Council, the Arlington Department of Veterans Services in conjunction with the Veterans Council will be conducting the annual Memorial Day ceremony on May 30th, 2016 at 9.30 a.m. in the auditorium of the Town Hall. Unlike previous years, there will be no parade from Walgreens to Monument Park. Instead, the entire ceremony will be conducted at the Town Hall. Following the observance, wreath-laying ceremonies and the unveiling of a new Veterans Memorial will be conducted at Mount Pleasant Cemetery. This year, Arlington will be dedicating the final Veterans Burial Plot at Mount Pleasant Cemetery. This Veterans Lot will be dedicated in honor of the men and women that have served our country throughout the ongoing Global War on Terrorism campaign. The keynote speaker will be Major General Jeffrey Clark. General Clark is the current Director of Defense Health Agency and former Commanding Officer of the National Military Medical Center at Bethesda. Medal of Honor recipient Captain Thomas K Kelly has sent remarks that will be shared. Please join the tribute at Town Hall to honor the men and women that have served and sacrificed so much for our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other reports or no, um, announcements or resolutions? Sir. Thank you. Uh, Charles Hartshorn, Precinct 1. On Saturday, June 11th, the Arlington Center for the Arts is going to host its, or it will have the first ever Arlington Porch Fest which is an outdoor musical event that's going to have like a, more than 100 bands that are going to be playing on over 60 porches distributed around East Arlington from 1 to 5 o'clock. So it should be great. Uh, there's a hardworking committee hammering out the final details, but you can get information at arlingtonporchfest.org. And that's June 11th, 1 to 5, Saturday. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any others? Seeing none, any reports of committees? Ms. Brazil. Julie Brazil, Precinct 12 and Chair of the Vision 2020 Standing Committee. I move that town meeting receive the report of Vision 2020. All in favor receive the report of the Vision 2020 Committee, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It is so received. Thank you very much. Hmm? Yeah. Thank you. Um, the report is on the back table and will be uh, distributed electronically to the town meeting member list. I just want to highlight a couple of things. Um, Arlington received a, a National Endowment for the Arts grant um, last year. True Story Theater is a local performing group, and they got a two-year grant to support civic engagement and work with town committees. Vision 2020 is the lead partner. We are joined by the Human Rights Commission, the Commission on Disability, and three Vision 2020 committees, Sustainable Arlington, the Diversity Task Group, and Arlington Public Art. Uh, keep an eye out for articles and emails. It's the Living Brochure is the name of the project, and it, the grant funds performances and workshops, and the workshops can be tailored to uh, the needs and interests of the town committees. Uh, True Story Theater does really interesting work. Um, attending one of their performances or workshops can bring new insight and inspiration to longtime volunteers, and of course we hope that uh, the performances um, will illustrate to uh, potential new volunteers uh, the work that the committees do in a way they can really connect to. If you know of any committee or in town that's interested in participating, please contact me. And then I want to give a quick update about one of Vision 2020's biggest projects, which is the annual town survey. This year, we received 7,386 responses. That is a 38% response rate, which does set a new record. Uh, we'll begin work on a more detailed analysis, but the report to town meeting contains uh, the basic summary of the data. I, of course, invite any of you here tonight or those watching at home to consider volunteering. The survey is a fascinating project, and we can always use more help. Uh, we have new software that helps with both scanning and data analysis, and we can use volunteers um, who know something about survey design uh, or who like to do data analysis. And of course, we can always use extra hands unfolding and scanning all those pieces of paper. Of particular interest to town meeting members may be the increase in the number of households who participate in precinct meetings. We asked in 2013, and 3% of households then had attended a precinct meeting. This year, it was up to 12%, so that's a nice increase. 
Vision 2020 will continue to help explore ideas and work with precincts to build on that progress, and of course, we'll keep you all up to date. We also have a new, very colorful display about Vision 2020 in the lobby, and I hope you'll take a look at it. Thank you. Any other reports of committees? Seeing none. Mr. Costi. Move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. All in favor laying 3 upon the table, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Article 3 is on the table. That brings us back to the special town meeting. We're going to take up Article 3, which is the only one left. Uh, Mr. Carmen. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dean Carmen, Arlington Finance Committee. Um, I handed out, I was here on, on Monday, I handed out a three-page um, memo on the topic. If you go to the last page, we have the recommended vote. Also there is the recommended vote. Oops. Finance Committee is recommending that the town appropriate and borrow a sum of money of $2.55 million for the architectural design, engineering, and project management of the Gibbs School Building, yeah, contingent upon the passage yeah. of, a prop two, of the Prop 2 and debt exclusion. Yeah. So, before we ask for a whole bunch of money, I figured I should explain to everybody why we, why we need it. The simple answer is that school enrollment in Arlington has been growing and is, going, and is projected to continue to grow. The first chart I have behind me shows enrollment on, can't hear me. Can you hear me? Uh, I'll lean into it, okay. No, he's the first chart behind me shows school enrollment over five points in time. I started with the year 2000 when our enrollment leveled off as we were beginning the second phase of the elementary school rebuild campaign. We had 4,200, approximately 4,200 students in the system. This is what we based our rebuilds on. By the year 2010, we had grown to 4,800 students. Currently, we're at 5,300 students, and the projections are estimating that we will currently top off at 5,900 students. This is done, this growth from 4,200, or from 4,200 to 5,300, then to 5,900, with no net new increase in school capacity. The schools we had in 2000 are the schools we have now. It's also worth noting, because I think some people say, well, we had seven schools, but is that, did we, do we, have, did we have a lot of capacity at that time? Did we not have a lot of capacity? Prior to enrollment leveling off, or, or bottoming out in 2000, in the 1980s, we had gone through a process of closing schools. We closed four elementary schools. We closed the Crosby, the Parmenter, the Lock, and the Cutter. We closed a junior high. And that was done at the time to optimize capacity, to bring the overall school capacity in line with what we believed was the student population moving forward. To illustrate what's going on on a macro level, I like to use this chart behind me, which is one elementary school, the Thompson School. And what I do here is I take three points in time, October 2010, October 2015, and the 2021 McKibben projection. I do that because it, the, the three points in time actually link the kindergarten cohorts and the fifth grade cohorts, which is why, the, why I do the shading. If you notice, back in 2010, Thompson had approximately 335 students. The distribution of students by grade was in the, you know, it was a low of, let's say, 45, a high of 65, but it, but it looks stable. Move forward to this past fall, and, and you can see that kindergarten cohort, as they moved to fifth grade, stayed steady at about 60 students, but the cohorts coming in behind them are coming through a lot bigger. They're coming through at about 80. And so if you, see, if you think about that, projecting that out to 2020, 2021, that school, the school will now move to an even larger size. And that's the general gist of the school enrollment challenge. Smaller cohorts are leaving, large kindergarten classes are showing up. And so, before I ask you to spend, oh, actually, no, I'm gonna go this one. And so as they push up in the future into the Audison, it's, it's really gonna explode a school that's not built for that many students. And so while we're asking you to appropriate money for the Gibbs, while we're asking to bring the Gibbs back online, 
is simply to alleviate 1,400 students at some point from arriving at the Audison. Not only would that make us the biggest middle school in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, it, the school is simply not built for that many children. So if I, was at, if I was sitting in your seats and someone was standing up asking for a heck of a lot of money, I'd ask the first, the first question I'd ask is, why do you feel comfortable that these projections are gonna continue? Why do you feel that these large cohort sizes are gonna keep arriving in waves to you know, drive up enrollment? And I think this chart here does a good job of showing it because what we've learned through research is there's a correlation from the births of children that occurred five years earlier to the children that show up in kindergarten. And so if you look at the top where I wrote actual, th that first column of K classes, are the kindergarten classes that arrived. The next column is the births that occurred five years earlier. And so you see a conversion anywhere from, you know, 80 to 100% of children that were born five years earlier showed up in the kindergarten class. So down below where I say projected, it's not just, they're not all projections. Those births are the actual births that occurred in town for the years where the kids will arrive. And what you notice quickly is, while the numbers of the kids who are there and the, those births seem big, they're getting even bigger. And so there's just, there's no quantifiable evidence that would say that this is gonna slow down. So why the gaps? The biggest thing, after I shut up and told you what I, what I think is gonna happen, is uh, there's a recognition that the Gibbs is the most flexible option we have. You know, it provides immediate relief to the Audison Middle School. It could bring down the enrollment. It would, it would, it would be very helpful. But we don't necessarily know if these projections will hit exactly where we say they are. They could come in above. They could be, we think they'll be about 6,000. They could be 6,500, they could be 7,000. I mean, they could be 5,500. But by doing that, by opening the Gibbs, is we have the flexibility to do something with that building. It might have to be a K-5 to school someday. It might have to be a fifth grade only school someday. We could have roaring enrollment for 20 years, and then we might have to close it because enrollment might go back down again. But, and that's what the Gibbs does. I mean, the School Enrollment Task Force met. A lot of people have been looking at this issue. There's no other option out there that allows us the same flexibility to move with, you know, with what could be the you know, projections converting into actuals. You know, it's also the, the, the choice of the experts in this town, whether it's the superintendent of schools, who I spelled superintendent wrong, or, and I just, or, it's, um, or it's the fifth grade teacher at the middle school. And I do think in a lot of ways that holds credibility, because in my time in town meeting, you know, when the police chief and the fire chief and our experts weigh in, we hold that you know, as, as a strong condition. But for some reason, when the, when the superintendent talks, I think largely because it's our kids, we tend to have 252 educational experts in the room. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so I'll skip over that one. Um, you know, as a point of note, we've talked about modular classrooms in the past. I will point out modulars are no longer cost effective. We spent $3.1 million on modulars for the Stratton. The Thompson modulars, which are coming online, are going to come online at $735,000. And if we do pass this, this will be a continuation of a long-standing effort by the town to address the school enrollment challenge. Everything up there is what we've done from, you know, 2011 when we inflated special education costs by 7%. We, we implemented the growth factor of 25% in 2014. We adjusted it this last year. Line. Yep. I'll be done one sec. Okay, dokie. We adjusted the growth factor in 35. You know, we funded the Thompson, we rebuilt the Stratton, and now here we are. And so, you know, I ask you to support this motion, this, this spending article because it is the right decision. It will provide us the flexibility that we need for our school enrollment population, and it will prepare us for, you know, whatever comes forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chapdelaine. All right, good evening. Uh, Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, I'm gonna try to not repeat much of what uh, Dean said and take a bit of a 10,000 foot view in terms of the process uh, that the school enrollment task force followed over the past several months. Uh, so first off, the school enrollment task force was formed in response to the McKibben demographic forecast that was performed by the school department last year. Uh, and really it was, it was pulled together to analyze and then make recommendations for how to deal with these enrollment pressures and what the corresponding space solutions would be. Uh, the task force was actually pulled together in November of 2015. 
So uh, who was on the School Enrollment Task Force? We had two members of the Board of Selectmen, Diane Mahan and Joe Curro. We had three school committee members, Cindy Starks, Jeff Thielman, and Bill Hainer. We had the chair of the Finance Committee, Al Tosti. We had the chair of the Capital Planning Committee, Charlie Foskett. We had the chair of the Permanent Town Building Committee, John Cole. We had the superintendent, uh, superintendent of schools, Kathleen Bodie, and myself as town manager. And the primary reason that I'm here speaking about this is I was asked to facilitate slash chair the task force. So what did we focus on? Well, as Dean touched on, we immediately focused on the enrollment pressures at the Thompson Elementary School that were projected, well, they're currently hitting and really projecting to hit in September of 2016. Uh, we then focused on the near-term enrollment pressures at the Odyssey Middle School, also outlined by Dean. And we also discussed, uh, or began discussing, projected pressures at the Hardy Elementary School in the future. So in terms of our early recommendations, um, again, we did recommend to town meeting in January, uh, placing two modular classrooms at the Thompson Elementary School. Town meeting endorsed having the Finance Committee fund that via a reserve fund transfer. Those are now procured and will be installed in time for September 2016. Uh, we also, as a task force, recommended advancement of design of, per of a, uh, excuse me, a permanent expansion of six classrooms at the Thompson Elementary School. Uh, we're currently interviewing designers for that, should have a designer named by next week. Um, with the plan to actually uh, hold off on asking for final construction money until it's been designed, cost estimates are in hand, and then uh, have actual enrollment figures in hand in October, and then come back to town meeting and ask for construction money. So uh, what about the task force's analysis of these middle school pressures? So we began by reviewing multiple options that were presented by the superintendent. We looked at the potential of building an entirely new middle school on a yet to be identified site. We talked about an eighth grade building or a wing at a new Arlington High School. We talked about a renovation or reuse of the Gibbs School or an addition at the Otteson Middle. So we took the uh, new middle school off the table uh, for primarily cost implications. The estimates were that a new school would be 40 to $50 million. And also uh, a very strong reason being that there was no identified site and the co uh, cost of site acquisition would be uh, prohibitive. Next, we took the eighth grade building uh, off the table, primarily because of academic concerns as well as timeline concerns. Uh, a new high school, even though town meeting voted favorably to kick off the feasibility process earlier in town meeting session, uh, we wouldn't have a new high school online for the next four or five years, which would create pretty tremendous uh, modular costs of actually getting something online to deal with the enrollment pressures at the middle school. So that left us with the renovation or reuse of the Gibbs uh, or building an addition at the Odyssey Middle School. So based on that, the task force requested a uh, more in-depth study of those two remaining options so that an informed decision could be made. HMFH architects were brought on board to perform feasibility studies for both options. Uh, they came back and de uh, delivered an interim report to the task force in March, and then a final report that included questions and answers from both task force members and the public uh, in April, uh, actually just a few weeks ago in April. So the task force's recommendation. After review and deliberation, the task force voted seven to two to recommend moving forward with the Gibbs option. And that's why this vote is before you tonight. And some of the reasons that were cited by task force members, uh, somewhat repeating some of the things that Dean said, uh, were that the Gibbs option was uh, academically preferred and voted by the school committee as the academically preferred options. Uh, there were a number of site, neighborhood, and traffic impacts uh, surrounding the Odyssey edition that were cited as a reason uh, that it was not necessarily a viable alternative. And also, again, um, as Dean said, the future flexibility that's provided by the Gibbs option um, as opposed to the Odyssey option was a very compelling reason to move forward with the Gibbs. But how about impacts of the recommendation um, of going forward with the Gibbs? Uh, the task force certainly considered those. There are operating cost concerns with opening up a new middle school, whether it be a six or six, seven, eight. The superintendent provided incremental cost comparisons between an expansion on the Odyssey or operating a Gibbs in either of those alternatives, and they both have um, incremental costs above and beyond what um, opening up an addition or building and opening an addition of the Odyssey would cost, and those were considered. Uh, and I know the Finance Committee and uh, the School Committee will be working together to try to uh, responsibly manage those incremental costs um, should this go forward. Uh, also, um, very important is the impact on the existing Gibbs tenants. There's five very important tenants in the Gibbs School. They all provide very critical and valuable community services and community resources. Uh, and impacting them and um, having them have to leave the space is an impact we take very seriously. Uh, the Arlington Center for the Arts, or the ACA, 
probably been uh, the most vocal and most publicly discussed in terms of finding a new home. And I can't stand before you tonight and tell you that there is a solution in place or that they have a new home, but I can tell you I've been working regularly with the leadership of the ACA on the potential for them to find a new home and soon to be vacated space in the Central School. And um, not, again, I cannot commit that that will happen, but can commit that from the town administration point of view, we're working hard to see that they do have uh, a future in Arlington. And then finally, uh, very specifically, what will tonight's vote uh, get the town? Uh, so if uh, tonight's vote is successful, it would allow the town to move forward subject to the successful passage, uh, passage of the debt exclusion on June 14th to procure owner's project management services uh, or, or OPM services and design services for this Gibbs renovation option. And then that resulting design would allow a future town meeting to consider uh, construction funding for the project. So um, I ask for your favorable action on this article tonight and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Thielman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff Thielman, Precinct 12, and a member of the School Committee and the School Enrollment Task Force. So I want to give a little more history and perspective on the process that led to this evening's vote. Um, in July of 2015, Dr. Bodie, our superintendent, let the tenants of the Gibbs School know that the school district might exercise its right to repurpose the building as the town's 10th public school building. The tenants had signed three-year leases in 2014, and the superintendent's notice gave them two years to find alternative space. One tenant, the Leslie Ellis School, has already uh, a plan to relocate here in Arlington in July of 2017. For a long time now, the school committee has been in a conversation about what information we need and what we should do about expanded enrollment. Last summer, our focus on this issue intensified. We contracted with a consulting firm, McKibben and Associates, to do a better enrollment forecasting than we had done in the past. The analysis, which Dean Carmen shared tonight, showed us the town's enrollment will continue to grow, basically because houses owned by people without children are being purchased by those who have children or who are likely to have children. In the fall, the School Enrollment Task Force was formed and in January, the school committee organized a community forum that filled town hall with hundreds of people who weighed in on what to do about increased enrollment in the town. We have had more than 20 public meetings between subcommittees, the school committee, the task force, the forum, and we're going to have some more, and we've heard from hundreds of people. I began the process in favor of finding a way to expand the Addison Middle School. There were three reasons for my position, two of which were personal. First, my three children attend programming at the Arlington Center for the Arts. They love the camp, and between the three of them, they'll spend about eight weeks there this summer. As we looked more closely at using the Gibbs for a middle school, my children lobbied against the idea and sang mm -hmm. the ACA song, ACA is awesome, <clears throat> night after night. The second reason was that our family purchased a home in a part of town that allows our children to walk to their elementary school, to the Addison Middle School, and to the high school. I was reluctant to vote in a way that changed our family's plan. But the third and final reason is that I initially felt that the increased operating costs of running a school at the Gibbs would be a lot more than operating a larger Addison Middle School and would have a serious negative impact on our budget. In the course of 20 public meetings, and uh, with the input of many people here in the room, my analysis of all the data and my own viewpoint changed. And I became an enthusiastic proponent of using the Gibbs as a middle school. Here's what happened. And I think this happened to a lot of members or some members of the task force. First, it was clear that we could not build an appropriate addition to the Addison Middle School. The site simply would not permit it. An architect's analysis showed us that an addition would force us to do costly work inside the current building, and we would be creating a school where students were likely to lose classroom time because of the distance between classes. In addition, the new school would house 1,400 sixth through eighth graders and be the largest middle school in the Commonwealth. A large school is not ideal for the social, emotional growth of many of our students. 
Second, the Gibbs facility is in need of serious repair. The tenants would need to bear the cost of repairs, and whether the tenants stayed at Gibbs or moved elsewhere, they would see an increase in their expenses. Third, as Dean Carmen said, preserving the, the Gibbs as an asset of the town would give the school department maximum flexibility to address enrollment issues going forward. We can no longer plan and execute quality education in the town of Arlington in just nine school buildings. Fourth, one option we are exploring but have not made a final decision on, an all-town sixth grade at the Gibbs, is somewhat more expensive to operate than an expanded Odison, but not dramatically more expensive. The savings in our operating budget that I initially hoped for, represented by an Odison, expanded Odison, was outweighed, in my mind, and in the mind of many members of the task force, by doing what's best for teaching and learning. Fifth, the Gibbs presents an opportunity to create a smaller, smaller learning space which will improve learning outcomes for students who are arguably in the most vulnerable part of their educational journey in our school system. Finally, the town has offered to help all tenants find alternative space. The school district is offering the ACA camp space in one of our schools going forward, and the town has proposed alternative sites for ACA. While ACA will be in different sites in their future and where they're going to be located isn't clear yet, ACA will still be awesome. <laughs> With your vote tonight in favor of the Finance Committee's recommendation, our town, our schools, and our kids will be even more awesome than we are today. Repurposing the Gibbs as our 10th public school makes Arlington a better place to live and a better place to educate our young people. As we prepare for the June 14th debt exclusion, I urge you to give a resounding yes for all of the town's children tonight by voting in favor of the Finance Committee's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Liggett. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Liggett, Precinct 9. Uh, I stand before you, I stood before you at the special town meeting in January of this year to discuss the school enrollment challenges facing our town. I rose in support of Article 4 to pay for the modular classrooms for the Thompson School, but I also talked about the enrollment uh, challenges as being far larger than just one elementary school. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I also uh, spoke about the enrollment challenges being larger than just one elementary school, larger than East Arlington. In fact, they affect all of us. It's a town-wide issue. Whether you, and it affects every resident in our town, whether you happen to have students in the school system or not. I closed with a graph showing how big the issue is at the Audison and a promise to report back to the town meeting in April. Here I am. It's April-ish, and I'm... <laughs> I am thrilled to be standing before you tonight in support of Article 3. I believe this to be the best solution we could ask for to address the enrollment challenges facing our middle schools. Is it a perfect solution? No, it isn't. Are there downsides and disappointments? Absolutely. However, we are not starting from a clean slate as we wrestle with this complex problem. There are many constraints many conflicting priorities, and even more opinions about how to actually fix the problem. There is no perfect solution. The leadership of our town has been working diligently, and you've heard a lot about that already, to navigate and balance those competing and conflicting factors to figure out the best overall solution. There have been countless meetings. Actually, I guess they are counted because Jeff just said there were 20. So there have been 20 meetings. Um, involving more committees and subcommittees than I could possibly name. It doesn't include the hours of activity that have taken place behind the scenes, allowing that public face to be shown. For those efforts and for, arri for arriving at a solution that I believe to be the best one, I thank you all. Now, 
I'm a visual guy, so I want to pivot and take a look at what approval of this article actually looks like. This is the slide I closed with last January. I increased the font sizes because I personally have been struggling to be able to read the slides over the last few weeks. And you might notice a version number in the lower left corner, uh, but I didn't touch the content in any way. It's the same as you saw previously. The legend at the bottom identifies each of the schools and the number of students that particular school was designed to build or built to educate. The axis on the left shows the number of students that are above or below that capacity at each school. You can see that Audison was built for 1,050 students and is currently teaching about 1,130, using round numbers, about 80 more students than it's supposed to be holding. The red line climbing into the stratosphere speaks for itself. This is the same graph, but I've adjusted it and rescaled so that it actually also shows under capacity. That's not something we've talked about much, schools that are under capacity. You'll see the legend, Audison with no Gibbs. That's what we will live with if we vote no tonight. This slide shows what it looks like when you vote yes tonight. The Gibbs comes back online for middle school students, and there's a huge impact on the overcrowding at Audison. Huge. This graph shows the Audison capacity below at below capacity by anywhere from 124 to 264 students. Why that big a range? Because we don't exactly know who would go to the Gibbs yet when the renovation is complete, but that's okay. The critical thing is that we're solving the enrollment problem at the Audison. Now a quick comment about the two blue lines. I'm not advocating for one particular grade configuration. Instead, I'm showing two options based on the information we have available today. We know how big the sixth grades are projected to be. I lifted that information directly off the McKibben report. That's the dotted line. I have no idea how to project what a six through eight Gibbs middle school might look like, so I assume the maximum number of students would be sent to the Gibbs, 500. That's the dashed line representing the extreme end. Finally, on this slide, if anyone is concerned that we suddenly have this extra capacity at Audison and feels that the cost is too high and it's wasteful, rest assured that there are many ways that space will be used or could be used. It won't gather dust. Whether it's relocating the school department offices during the high school rebuild, relocating the preschool during the re rebuild, providing facilities to the ACA, or simply allowing the OMS students and faculty to decompress and spread out. The space will be used. That's all great, but it isn't reality yet. And there are a number of challenging steps that remain after tonight's vote on Article 3. The graph you just saw assumes that the Gibbs renovation is completed in time for students to attend in the fall of 2018. That may sound easy for those of us who are not in the field, but the experts involved all agree that will be a very tight timeline. The stakes are high though. If we don't get the job done and the Gibbs can't be used in September of 2018, all of those students will be packed into the Audison. That has major implications from a financial perspective and frankly may not even be possible from a logistical perspective. Between now and then, we have two years of increasing enrollment where we will be adding eight to 10 modulars, there's not gonna be space for additional modulars for 2018, not to mention the cost of those modulars. During those two years, there will be another 160-ish students packed into the same facility. There will be no relief for the bursting cafeteria, the media center, or the gyms. We can't absorb another year, we just can't. So to wrap this up, Please be part of the solution to the middle school problem by voting yes tonight and then continuing to support the debt exclusion going forward and helping in whatever way you're able to to prevent delays and accelerate and make sure we get into the Gibbs in 2018. I ask for your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Ms. Moyer.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Juliette Moyer, Precinct 1. I stand before you in support of Article 3, as recommended by the Finance Committee. I would like to cede my time to Jason Levy, Arlington resident and teacher at the Audison Middle School. Mr. Levy has been a teacher at Audison for nine years and was involved in the effort to collect the perspective of teachers at Audison with regard to the options for addressing the enrollment challenges facing the middle school, specifically around use of the Gibbs versus expanding the Audison. I believe he will provide a unique and valuable perspective to tonight's deliberation of the article. Mr. Levy is speaking on his own behalf. He is not speaking as a formal representative of Audison or Arlington Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, you have six minutes and 18 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Jason Levy, and I live at 64 Mystic Street. I come before you to speak in support of Article 3. This is my ninth year teaching at Audison Middle School. I started out when sixth grade had five clusters, then it had four. This year, it currently has 3.6 clusters of sixth grade. I currently teach sixth and seventh grade. I'm part of the split cluster. When I first started teaching, I did not have many concerns of social emotional needs of my students. As the population of Audison has increased, so has the social emotional needs of my sixth and now seventh graders. Back in March, faculty at Audison took a survey presenting three options to deal with the increasing enrollment at Audison. The three options were expanding OMS, sixth grade at Gibbs, or six through eight at Gibbs. 90% of teachers picked one of the Gibbs options as their top choice. I am here today to voice my own opinion why Gibbs is the best option to meet the needs of our students. Expanding OMS simply will not work. So you may ask, why not expand Audison? It is already one of the biggest middle schools in the state. The recommended size of a middle school is between six to 800 students. There is infrastructure stress. Kitchen, plumbing, heat, and pipes have already burst. Removing outdoor space will prevent classes from using traditional space, which will prohibit teachers from meeting the curriculum, especially physical education. With possible blasting, this will be disruption to learning and to the neighborhood. Unsupervised areas in shared spaces are overcrowded, such as the media center and especially the hallways. This is causing students to come late to class. This will not be the best environment for learning. Expansion is not the best option for students having a sense of community. It would violate the middle school model in needs of young adolescents. It would make it harder to build teacher-student relationships. Challenges to teaching and learning in a large space. Challenges to parking, which is an issue. Traffic issues in the mornings and afternoons. This is already a major issue and during special events. Will the increase of students mean no school assemblies? How will the expansion affect the schedule if a fourth block lunch is added? How early or late will students now have to have lunch? It would also be harder to schedule classes for students. More students, harder to make the schedule. We are currently today at 1,128 students at Audison Middle School. Within five to six years, we will increase the school's population by 200. Within eight years, we are forecast to hit 1,400 students. Based on the School Enrollment Task Force report of this past December, OMS is consistently forecast to have within 200 less students compared to the entire student population of Arlington High School. This illustrates that the increase in student enrollment is making Audison feel more of a junior high or high school than a traditional middle school model, which includes our cluster system. So you may ask, why Gibbs? Smaller student population will not be as overcrowded as OMS is now, and especially if there is the expansion. It will allow the relationships between students and teachers to flourish. There will be a better sense of community. It will allow better support for the social emotional needs of students. 
This will make it a truer middle school model of individualized instruction and community building. In conclusion, these are the reasons why Gibbs is a better option than expanding Audison Middle School to deal with the increase of enrollment. The expansion of Audison will only lead to an environment that prohibits students from reaching their potential. Gibbs will provide all students, whether they attend Audison or Gibbs, a better learning environment and a better sense of belonging to their community. It will also allow relationships with their peers and teachers to flourish. As a veteran sixth grade teacher, I support the Gibbs option over the Audison expansion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Leonard. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. A question, if I could, that on the, the module classrooms aspect of uh, this conversation. One thing I'm not hearing a lot about, I'm hearing that module classrooms are, could be a permanent situation, could be a temporary situation. But let's take, for instance, that in maybe like with the Thompson School, where it possibly might be a temporary situation, those classrooms are going to be on what I would call <clears throat> Thompson property while they're temporary. So as not to be confusing, is the appropriations when these schools are done over to repair any damage that might have been incurred when these module classrooms were installed, is that included in the appropriation to make the property such as the basketball court, parking lot, or whatever, back to the way it was before those module classrooms were installed? Mr. Chaplain, does the appropriation include remediation? Adam Chaplain, town manager. Tonight's appropriation has no funds being requested for modular classrooms. However, uh, when contracts are signed in terms of modular classroom placement, there is site remediation costs included. The only reason I brought it up, Mr. Chaplain, is because it talked about the design, construction, expansion, temporary, permanent, or whatever. And that's why I brought up the subject of the modular classrooms. I just wanted to find out if, which you, you might have already answered, could we be looking at something like the job is done at the Thompson School, but now we're coming back a year later for an appropriation to do a new basketball court, a new parking area, due to the damage that was caused by the modular classrooms being installed. Mr. Chaplain. Adam Chaplain, town manager. The modular units being installed at the Thompson will not be on any basketball court or parking area. They will be predominantly on the grass area in front of the main entrance to the school. Uh, the most damage I could see being done is to uh, the grass in that area, perhaps one sidewalk, so any remediation costs should be minimal at most and are, again, included in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, sir. This woman right over here, yep. Nope. No, no, behind you, the lady. Yep. Right in front of Miss Hanson. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Betty Stone, Precinct 7. And I'm also a, uh, on the board of directors of the um, awesome Arlington Center for the Arts. I've lived in East Arlington for almost 13 years, and I chose to make my home in Arlington for its sense of neighborhood and community, for its coffee shops, restaurants, and interesting mix of retail, for the Capitol and Regent theaters, for its green spaces and the commitment of its citizens to civic engagement and for its lively arts and culture scene. The Arlington Center for the Arts is extremely important to our town and to me personally. The ACA is a 27-year-old treasure that neighboring towns around uh, 
this area envy. Arlington would simply not be the same without the ACA. My adult daughter is grown and out of town, so I'm not directly um, affected by our school enrollment issues. I am, however, an educator by training. Uh, I had a career of 32 years in education and a property owner. Great schools, vibrant town, and strong property values go hand in hand. You want services, you gotta pay taxes. I intend to support this article as proposed by the Finance Committee, but I do so mindful of the fact that its very success creates enormous challenges for the Arlington Center for the Arts. So I urge you all to cast your vote and then stay in the conversation after town meeting adjourns and see what you can do to help keep the Arlington Center for the Arts alive and healthy. I would like to cede the remainder of my time to Linda Shoemaker, Executive Director of the Arlington Center for the Arts and an Arlington resident. Okay. Five minutes, 10 seconds, Ms. Shoemaker. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Linda Shoemaker, um, 33 Warren Street. I am the Executive Director of the Arlington Center for the Arts. Of all of the displacements uh, triggered by Gibbs' decision tonight, the Arlington Center for the Arts is the little guy in the equation, most at risk of not surviving this change. So I'm here tonight not to oppose the motion, but to ask for your help. Because while ACA may be small, we're passionate, and we're committed to the importance of the arts for our kids and teens, for ourselves, for the flavor, for the identity, and the well-being of our community. And we have a great song. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, so as an organization, we want to grow to meet this challenge so that the Arlington Center for the Arts will able, be able to leave the Gibbs Building, if that's what you decide, and not simply survive, uh, but to, to grow and become an even better asset for the town. But tonight what I need you to know is that we have an enormous challenge in front of us. We don't yet know how and where we're going to land next June. Uh, we're working hard to create our own best future. And you've already heard tonight really significant statements of support from the town manager and the school committee, and, and we are incredibly grateful for that. But we, this will need to be a public-private partnership to save the Arlington Center for the Arts. And we will need uh, partners and investors and supporters of all kinds. We will need you to help save the Arlington Center for the Arts. Now, I don't want to assume that you know who we are. So tonight, we distributed a, a handout that tries to summarize some of the value we think we bring to the town. And in case you don't know the history, um, when the Gibbs Building went offline about 30 years ago, uh, town leaders and town meeting here in this room decided uh, to create space to build an art center in Arlington, um, to offer a subsidized rent in the Gibbs Building that would be offset by the higher capacity organizations that share that, that building with us. And I wanna say, I think after 30 years, the Arlington Center for the Arts has made good on that investment. Um, if you, you know, as you have some time to renew the handout, I think some of the things I'd just like to surface right now. The Arlington Center for the Arts pr provides Arlington with a home for our creative kids and teens. Serving over 1,500 kids a year with camps and classes and opportunities for kids, for our kids to develop self-esteem, critical and creative thinking skills, and to find their own voice, their place, and their people through the arts. ACA also is a, is a source of cultural vibrancy for our town, presenting programs that make Arlington an attractive place to live and work and visit. Uh, programs like Shakespeare in the Park, like Arlington Open Studios, like Porch Fest coming, coming to us this, this June. These are some of the things that we wanna make sure don't go away with this decision um, tonight. So what does the future look like and how can you help? So I can't say tonight, as Mr. Chapdelaine said earlier, we don't have, we don't know. 
We don't know. Uh, for the last nine months, we've been scanning the town, talking to realtors, looking at properties, exploring all kinds of options, under one roof options, dispersed options, and we've been talking with the town about what might be possible in town property. Um, we're deeply appreciative of the support and the effort of the town manager, Adam Chapdelaine, and also um, Selectman Joe Kiro and members of the school committee in this process. There's a real commitment. I believe there's a real public commitment from the town to find a path forward to save the Arlington Center for the Arts. So, so, what, so we were asked a lot, what can I do? How can I help? And I think the first thing that you can do to help is to support the town in its willingness, in its effort to help find a place for ACA. We are gonna need that. We are gonna need that support and they're gonna need your support um, to, to take us down that path. We also need to ask you, we need to ask our community as a whole to support ACA's fundraising efforts going forward as generously as you can. We've been lucky as an arts organization and unique in a, as an arts organization in town that we've had the subsidized rent from the town in the past, which has meant we've been able to devote our time and our money and our effort to presenting programs. And what we know now is we're gonna need to grow as an organization and develop um, ourselves into the next stage of as, as a nonprofit organization. Um, I believe as, a, as an organization and as a community, we have the passion and the vision to do this, but we're gonna need a lot of money. We're gonna need a lot of money to make it to make it happen. Mr. Chapdelaine described the possibility of moving the Arlington Center for the Arts into the Central School. Oh gosh, we're out of time. You can wrap it up. Okay, so it's a fascinating possibility. It could be a really exciting possibility for us in the community. Um, we need help to meet the town in the middle to make that a realistic possibility. So we are in short order going to be going to be launching a capital campaign to, to, to get the money together that we need to do that. We're estimating conservatively $500,000. That's a big chunk um, to make a move in the next 14 months. And between now and then, the launch of the capital campaign, you, we, I invite you Shoemaker. to visit Dar Arlington Center for the Arts.org. The ACA Future Fund is online, and starting today, you can give uh, to ensure a future for the Arlington Center for the Arts. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Weaver? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Janice Weaver, Precinct 21. I've had several calls to my home and to my office um, concerning the schools. And most people are for it, they're not against it, but they do have questions. One of the questions is, um, are these feasibility studies necessary for every time we make a move? Is it a law to have them, or do we have engineers in town that could easily study? Does anyone know that? Mr. Chapdelaine? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, it's certainly not the law. Um, that these feasibility studies need to be performed. Uh, if it was an MSBA process, uh, like we're going through the high school, it would, in, would not be necessarily law, but regulation that we'd uh, follow a feasibility study. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, the school enrollment task force felt like a deeper dive into the buildings and their systems and the uh, so, sort of high level architecture uh, would be very important. So we don't have in-house the architectural or design expertise or the, uh, the building systems engineering expertise that you would need to do the level of analysis that these feasibility studies provided Thank you. us. And um, someone asked me about the extra resource rooms in one of the schools. I don't know if it was the uh, rebuilding of, or the addition to the Thompson or whatever, but they seemed to think there were too many resource extra rooms and they wanted to know why they were all there and if they would really be necessary. I don't know if anyone has the answer to that. Dr. Bodie? Oh, yeah, that's true. Maybe here. Kathleen Bodie, Superintendent. Um, in the Arlington Public Schools, we provide um, support services for special education students that require academic support. Um, we require um, classroom space for English language learners. We also have, at the middle school level, 
um, interventions for mathematics support, and we also have counseling spaces. We, we need to have room for occupational therapy, uh, physical therapy. There are a lot of services that are part of a public school education today, which I think for many people may not have been as, uh, uh, there years ago. So yes, there are a lot of small spaces that have to be carved out um, in a school for all of these services. And you have um, people to go into all of these facilities. I mean, they're not just going to be empty every day? No, okay. they will not be empty. All right, thank you. Um, now, you've spoken about engineers, task force, uh, enrollment costs, expansions, architects. We have three tax increases because of the three school questions and also because of the CPA. But um, what I really wanted to um, ask you is why we never, ever have anything for maintenance for these buildings. Everyone that owns a home in this town I'm sure maintains it well, as well as they can. And a lot of us have old houses like old people like me. But um, I want to know why there's never any um, maintenance put into these buildings because they shouldn't be falling down. And it seems strange to me that the cutter, the lock, um, the parment, all of those schools that were so decrepit managed to uh, resurge into something better. And I want to know. I want to know if we're ever going to have maintenance. I know that Public Works was cut drastically, and I think that maybe outsourcing it isn't the question, but that's not, that's not for now. I just want to know why maintenance is not ever built into these. Um, Mr. Chapdelaine, are you going to budget for maintenance if we build you these schools? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Um, I, I think that's a very fair question. and. The, w the way I would answer that is last year a town meeting voted for the first time to create a facilities department mm -hmm. so that we can actually focus on these very issues, uh, implement, which we're already beginning to do, implement a systematic maintenance program for all of our buildings, schools and town buildings. Okay. Uh, we've invested a lot of money in the new elementary schools, uh, in the, our fire stations. We're investing money right now in the police station, high school to come, uh, public work. So I, I think it is very important. And, last year establishing that facilities department, continuing to put it together, consolidate it from the school and the town, uh, hopefully we'll achieve exactly what you're asking for. Good, thank you. And one more thing, there is land for sale behind Gold's Gym, so we could develop that and maybe the um, Arlington Center for the Arts could go there. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14, motion to terminate debate. We have a motion to terminate debate on special town meeting article three. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? In my opinion, it is a two-thirds vote. <clears throat> the debate is terminated. We now have before us a recommended vote of the Finance Committee to appropriate and borrow $2,550,000. This is a two-thirds vote because it's bonding. So we are going to use our clickers soon as Mike is ready. Okay, go ahead and vote. One for yes, two for no. Yeah. Is it an affirmative vote? 187 in the positive, seven in the negative. There's a vote and I so declare it. That ends all of the articles in the special town meeting. Mr. Tosti. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I move that the... Quiet, please. Um, <clears throat> I move that the special town meeting be dissolved. All in favor of special, dissolving the special town meeting of 2016, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It's a vote and I so declare it. The town meeting is dissolved. Special town meeting is dissolved. <laughs> I would have liked to have done the regular. Hold on, Mr. Klein. Um, that brings us back to the Article 35 of the regular town meeting. Mr. Klein, for what purpose do you rise? Quiet, please. Christian Klein, Precinct 10. I rise to move reconsideration on Article 29. 
Okay. Article. Because I already stepped down to this other article, I'm going to step down on this article. Mr. Um, O'Connor will take over for the reconsideration vote and if we reconsider. Just to remind the members, we have in Article 1, Section 10E of the bylaws regarding a motion for reconsideration that, first of all, the proponent, uh, the mover of this motion must have requested the moderator to uh, give notice of reconsideration and voted on the prevailing side. I do believe you voted on the prevailing side. Uh, it requires a two-thirds vote of town meeting and um, <clears throat> one of the criteria for this purpose is that new information came before us. So has new information come before us, Mr. Klein? Since the time of vote, yes. Okay. So we'll hereby take a vote for an article for reconsideration. May I speak to the article? What's may, I that? Speak to, may I speak to the motion? It's a debatable motion. It's a debatable motion but you can't speak to the content of the article itself. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think everyone would have received through email, I had sent out um, my reasoning behind asking for reconsideration. Essentially, um, there is new information. It was made apparent um, on Monday night by the, <coughs> excuse me, by the town manager um, in regards to the size of the, the parcel that's being, that was originally presented and um, other issues related to it. So I ask that we reconsider this vote in light of the full information that we have available to us. Thank you. The gentleman on the right side, I didn't get the name of the person who wanted to speak. Um, Mr. Worden? Thank you, Mr. Assistant Moderator. Um, may I, uh, am I going to get a full seven here? Uh, yes, you'll get a, well, we're not debating the article. We're only debating the purpose of the, whether the motion should be voted upon. I, 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 re I realize that. I uh, <coughs> presided at a few of those. Um, uh, 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 John Worden, uh, 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 Precinct 8. Um, all right, we're, 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 not, we're only talking about the need to reconsider. And, and I think um, the, uh, the, the need to reconsider is, is extraordinarily clear in this case because the issue before us uh, was the release of a, an easement for a road taking uh, uh, made back in, in the 50s, the public purpose at that time to extend a street. Um, and uh, the, uh, upon questions, um, it was asked whether the abandonment of this easement would create a buildable lot. And the information we were going the information we were giving is that it would not do so. Uh, that information was incorrect. And therefore, we did not have a debate based upon the, the, um, uh, the, the situation it actually obtains. And that is, this, that is the debate that we had a couple years ago. Mr. Worden, I hate to interrupt, lot. 
but I must request that we keep this just to the matter of whether there is new information. So to speak about the history from the prior votes, I don't think that is um, within the scope of our discussion at this time. Well, the, the, we, we, we're using a different criteria for reconsideration than we used to use, uh, Mr. Connor. Um, however, the, well, the, there is clearly new information um, the new, the, uh, which, which, and, and we need to ha bring that forward and discuss it in order to reach a proper decision on, on, on this article, which, um, uh, on, on which we, we hurriedly uh, made a decision on, on inadequate uh, and, and incomplete information at the previous session. So please vote yes on the reconsideration. It doesn't mean you have to to vote differently than you did before, but at least let's vote on with all the facts in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Worden. Ms. Deschler? Christine Deschler, Precinct 19. Motion to terminate debate on the motion for reconsideration. Second. Having heard a second. second. Okay, we'll take a vote, Mike on um, reconsideration. So if you'd like to terminate debate, press one. If not, press two as the light goes green. The motion carries, and I so declare it. So we'll now take a vote for reconsideration. It requires a two-thirds vote. If you'd like to reconsider the motion, or reconsider Article 29, please press 1. If not, press 2 when the light goes green. It is a two-thirds vote, so we will reconsider. The percentage was 72 percent. Okay, we'll now take up Article 29. Yes. Who, who, who's asking to table it? Uh, since this came as to a surprise to us tonight, I believe that we should hear this at a later date and proceed with the rest of town meeting with the new information that we have. So I'm asking to table it. Second. Okay, the motion to table has been heard. All in favor of tabling Article 29 until next, what, you have a date certain? We just... Table it. We don't have. Are we going to postpone it or are we going to table it? I would table it at least to uh, the end of the, the of the night if we get finished and if we don't, then next. Table is a table. Table is a table. Next Wednesday.
They said they can't hear you. You need to speak into the mic, Mr. Logan. No, I do. They said you. They said you. Oh, the mic was turned off. Sorry about that. Okay, so we're going to hear, uh, we're going to vote on whether to table the article until later on. All those in favor of tabling, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Motion against carries, so we'll take up the motion right now. Anyone wishing to speak to this article? Mr. Leone. John Leone, Precinct 8. I'm here as a representative of this. Does this one? Oh, here we go. John Leone, Precinct 8. I'm here as a representative with Oak Time, um, with David Dolan, the um, owner of the parcel in question. The clock. Jimmy, turn the clock on. Oh. There we go. I got you, John. So this is a, actually, we were here on Article 29 for $28,000 to re release a sideline agreement. Back in April of 1942, the town of Arlington took. Does this work? Here we go, I'll blame myself. There it is. Well, it, this thing doesn't really work well. So you see where it says 30,094 square feet taken above lots 83 and 84. The town took what they call a sideline agreement back then for a couple, or like a thousand something dollars. That, all that does is allow, is prevent the homeowner from being able to build within those lines in case the town ever wants to build a road. If they want to build a road, we have to go back and actually do a taking and take the property for good. Two years ago, we released the sideline agreement where it says 43,007 and to the left of that. We released that a couple, two years ago. It's the second time we had come back. We got about 60,000, 65,000 for that. It's more than twice as big as the piece we're releasing. So what we now have is a sideline agreement and basically that little triangular piece up the top of lots 83 and 84. That's now owned by Mr. Dolan. He'll answer any questions you have. Can I have the next slide please, David? So what he owns now is about a year, year and a half ago, if I'm, he'll tell you if I'm wrong, he bought that house which owned the whole 14,000 square feet of land. My clicker, if the thing worked, I could show you. Oops, well there we go, look, I got a dot. So scroll down some. So right there, he put a line in and made two lots out of his 14,000 square feet. So he has a 7,000 square foot lot with a house on it that he's rebuilding. If you've driven down Pleasant View Ave, you've seen that house. It literally had trees growing through the porch. It was a wreck. He's rebuilding that now. What he's asking us to do is release that sideline agreement, which cuts through from that dot right there to about the corner of the lot here. So what you see with these dotted end lines is the building envelope. That is where he can place a home on that property as of and by right without having to ask permission of the town except for a building permit, which he can get. So what we're really doing is just releasing that sideline agreement over the corner of that building envelope. It's not really going to change anything. He's got a new, he's got that lot that he can have as of right. He's paying us to release it. Um, 28000 Yeah, $28,000. Um, we're getting back our initial payment to him, brought to the current present day value, as well as recapturing as many years back taxes as Mr. Chaplain can legally do. So we're releasing that little agreement off of the property. He's going to be able to place his house if he wants to build one. He's not even sure he's going to build one. He'll get up and tell you if you ask him in that space somewhere. So he has that big spot, he can do it. All we're doing is cutting off the bottom. He's just asking us to release it. What it really does is he can do it, he could sell it, but title insurance companies don't like it because the town could always come along in the future and say, we want to put a ethereal road 
through that little tiny triangle. Where that road's going to go, I don't know, because we released the rest of the road. So we're really just kind of cleaning up our own mess by releasing it, and he's paying us to do it. Yes, it's making his piece of property more sellable in the future, but it, he can put the house there anyways. People think that maybe we're going to prevent him from some sort of, by some sort of zoning maybe, by not letting him build a house there, but really, he's got a right to do it. We're just making it easier for him in the future to place the house and to sell the property in a more efficient manner. If you have any questions, I'll gladly answer them, or well, Mr. Dolan's here, so please, we'll answer any questions you have. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Klein. One slide from me. All right, well, essentially the uh, Christian Klein Precinct 10. Um, the slide I had was sort of a side-by-side -side look at the two, sort of as they described them before. So essentially, as far as the registry of deeds, I did a title, uh, a deed search last week on this. Um, <clears throat> the, currently the lots are, are 10,000 and 3,000, and so they're being combined and, -subdi and subdivided, as was explained. Um, the question I have for the proponent is this new lot that's being created in the, the just the new 7,000 square foot lot? Is have they had it surveyed and will it meet? Will they be able to construct a building and make a 30% um, usable open space? It has been surveyed. This is official surveyed lot. You can see the seal. Mm -hmm. uh, John Leone, Precinct 8, um, on behalf of David Dolan, uh, the owner. This is a survey right here. That's why it's sealed. As far as the 30% open space, that will be when he decides to place the house on the lot. Okay. The size of the house, he will have to meet those requirements with his building permit with Mr. Okay. Um, Byrne. Right, because usable open space requires that 75% of the 30% is less than 8% degree, 8 grade. And it seems to be a, quite a steep site. And so I'm curious if it is developable within that guideline. I, don't really know if that's up to our building inspector to determine at the time the house is placed on the site and the grade designations are made. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Worden. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Moderator. Uh, John Worden, Precinct 8. Um, now, um, it would be helpful if the plans showed uh, actually how much, what, where, this, uh, where this street taking or this sidelines, whatever, uh, is with relation uh, to the lot, uh, uh, to the... Uh, um, now, all right, so, so uh, again, uh, precisely, uh, is it this this bulgy thing here or what? I'm sorry, I, it's hard, hard to look at the map and and speak to you. Um, anyway, um, it's it seems that um, remember this, it's the master plan. Um, we um, and the master plan speaks uh, among other things of the need to um, uh, preserve open space in our town. And if, if there's one thing that's really um, uh, 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 in very short supply here, it's open space. And it's also the one thing that you can't hardly get more of. So, um, and in fact, one of the implementation steps uh, is to use CPA funds to acquire more open space. Here it seems to me is we have an opportunity to acquire open space for free because we have already, uh, the town has a long time ago, took a slice of this land as um, for a public purpose, that is the uh, construction of a street. Um, that public purpose is no longer 
deemed necessary. Uh, and so, but there's a new public purpose, the preservation of open space, which um, those of you who were here last year, and that's most of you, um, uh, endorsed, this, endorsed this plan. And I, I think we're, we're having a, really having a discussion of whether it means anything or it's just another thing to gather dust on a shelf somewhere. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we're now told uh, both that, that it wasn't a building lot and it's, it's a building lot, but you don't need this piece of it. Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know which, uh, which of these things is the case. The fellow wants to build this house, and if you look at that building envelope, uh, is that still up here? Uh, the building envelope, if you look at that, it's, uh, and you look at the house that's just above it, uh, which would be just north of it, which uh, uh, is either a totally reconstructed or a new house, um, it's about twice as big. So it would be on the scale, if they built into that envelope, it would be on the scale of the, uh, the, the, the mega buildings which are next to it in the parcel that was released a couple years ago. So um, the, um, uh, the, the, um, <coughs> So that's, that, 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 that's what apparently uh, could be built. And I guess Mr. Uh, Mr. Leone is telling you that it could be built whether we release this or not. Uh, they'd like to have a theoretical street taking going right by the front porch. I guess they, they, they could. Uh, this is, uh, but uh, if, if, we are going to, if we're going to release uh, this, this piece of land, uh, which it seems to me we should not, um, it's, it's, it's because it's open space being so rare in our town. Um, at least it seems to me we should get a decent price for it. Now, a, a building lot in, in this town, as you perhaps know, goes for around a quarter million dollars. We're selling this slice to make this a, a, a better sized lot for a, a tenth of that. So I, 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 I would, I would uh, urge you to uh, re reject uh, uh, to, to, to you having reconsidered to, to, re to reject this vote and let them come back next year at least with an, app an appropriate price for spending all this money for our schools and so on and but I don't think we can afford to give away this slice of land. Thank you. M Mr. Deist. The gentleman in the white shirt in the back of the center left, center left, not you, the, it was the center row. This gen yes, sir, you. Okay, we'll take a five minute break, seven minute break. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. There, there's a word that we're all uh, grasping for tonight and that's appraisal. Uh, we're asking, uh, do we agree with the idea of the town uh, giving up an interest in real estate? And if we do, do we feel that the uh, amount of money, value, consideration in, in real estate talk, uh, the consideration that, that the town is expecting to receive for this is uh, valid and sufficient? I don't know how to do an appraisal. I know how appraisers work. I know that three competent, licensed, experienced appraisers can bring you back at least five opinions on, 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 what, on what the value of, of uh, some piece of real estate is, but this is where they make their living. It's a special situation. Can you really simply say that it's, you know, you know a couple of years ago we, we, we had a situation similar to this and we gave them that much money and this one is like that but it's a little smaller so a little bit less. This was the question I raised in the original debate. To me that's just not sufficient. That's not detailed enough. We don't have a method here to look at. There are all kinds of questions that are going around the room tonight. Would, what would the value, of, what would the fair market value of the resulting property be should the town decide to give up this interest in its real estate? Is it a buildable lot? Is it more valuable to another purchaser? Could it be bought for open space? Is there even a market? Is there, are, are there buyers out there that would be willing to buy this interest 
uh, for open space. So what are the market conditions? What, what would the resultant value be? Do we look at this strictly as, you know, it was X dollars in 1942, let's figure in the interest, uh, throw in a figure for taxes and, and think that, oh, all we're doing is, you know, you know, you know running the, um, you know, the, the federal bond chart forward 70 something years when we know how much real estate has appreciated from pre-war prices to today? Is there a better way that takes more facts into consideration? I think there is. I think we should have an appraisal in front of us. I wish we had one tonight. We could look at its presumptions and, and test those, those uh, you know, you know, conditions and facts, and then we would be informed. Tonight we're not informed. This can always come back to us at another time. So I'm going to ask you to vote no. Ms. LaCourt. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. Is there someone here who can tell me how many of these kinds of parcels of land the town has? How many places we have outside lines? Mr. Uh, man town Manager? Adam Chapdelaine, Town Manager. Uh, the legal department in engineering did take a look. Uh, the, the level of uh, work that it would take to go through the paper mm -hmm. files uh, Frankly, it was mm -hmm. too time-consuming and cumbersome to be able to quickly put together a list. We did not. Put, we have not performed that. Okay, thank you. So, when the issue of dropping lines like this on the original parcel that we debated a few years ago first came up, and I was on the board of selectmen, I asked that same question and got the same answer. We do not know how many of these kinds of properties we own, and the difficulty was that whatever we did about one, we were setting a precedent for all of the others. And we set that precedent. And I think as a town meeting, we were pretty happy with that precedent at the time. And the town manager has applied the same formula to this property. The good news is that if this kind of an issue comes up again, okay, we will ask for the same consideration. And to me, that's what's important here. I don't think, I think you could make a cogent argument for why we shouldn't ask for anything at all. Because these outside lines would have been completely valueless to us in 1970, and things change over time. But now we have a precedent and a formula, and I think that that's what we should vote on. Um, yeah, it makes a buildable lot. Um, there may be many of these around town that we don't know about. Um, there have been instances where, because it suited the town's purposes, that we dropped outside lines for nothing. So the fact that we're getting any money at all seems like a bonus to me. And I think that this fairly balances the needs of the community against the rights of the property owner. So that's my opinion. Mr. Jameson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Minister Moderator Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. This one really is low tonight, isn't it? Um, so I want to clear up things that I think people are, are mixing here. So, um, Mr. Moderator, who owns the land? Easement, the whole block, who owns that land? Easement aside. Uh, Mr. Leone, can you come forward and answer that? Perhaps the town council? Okay, Mr. Heim, but I'm just thinking, Mr. Jameson, please refer to the moderator for appointment of yes, the Yes, Mr. Speaker. Moderator, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Doug Heim, Town Council. The, uh, the property owner owns the land. We don't own the actual land itself. Okay, and then who owns the easement? It's, a, it's, it's technically called an exterior line. It's a property interest that basically gives us the ability to establish a road and there would have to have been some further steps. So it's an interest that we possess. Um, I, you could characterize it as ownership, but it's, it's a highly unusual so, type so of situation. A different yeah. interpretation through the moderator might be that it enables us to build the road should we choose as a town. That's a fair characterization. But we would still, after that, still have to acquire the property proper. That's, that's correct. Okay, so, we, so, so all, we're, all we're doing 
is selling back to the property owner the right of the town to build a road and that would require us to then buy the property from the property owner. Is that confusing enough? We don't own the property. We own the right to build a road through that property. But to do that, we would have to acquire that property. Okay? So we're not selling them the property. We're just selling the right that the town currently has, if it, w it decided, which it didn't decide to do, to subsequently acquire that property in full and build a road through it. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of this article. I don't think this is really um, something we should spend this much time with. I know some people are vehemently against that. And to that argument, I would suggest that this is analogous to spot zoning, which is illegal. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. You're welcome. Mr. Rebelak. Steve Rebelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Would it be possible to bring that land plan back? Would it be possible to bring the land plan back? No, not that one, the one, the, the one that was stamped by the surveyor. It says Spring Street right at the bottom. That's the plan, okay. Uh, I, first, I want to thank Mr. Klein or whomever provided this because, gosh, with all the, the talk about property and stuff, it's actually great to be able to look at something and it, get, it just makes it a lot more concrete. Uh, Mr. Moderator, if I can, I'd like to walk through a couple of aspects of this plan um, and maybe, um, maybe Mr. Leone or Mr. Klein or someone from the building department who's familiar with land plans would um, like to entertain a couple of questions? Yes, we could do that. Mr. Moderator? Yes, we could do that. Okay, so uh, basically we have two lots here. There's, I'll just call them the top one and the bottom one. So on the top one, uh, there is a cross-hatched area which is roughly two, sort of two rectangles. Uh, it's currently a, that, so that denotes an existing structure. Correct. Okay, and, what, and actually, it's uh, there's so there's basically a main house, and there is a the lower part is labeled garage to be removed. Correct. Okay, and now there's all, and then there's you know like a proposed garage up towards the top. Now this the new, relative to the new uh, the new building footprint, there is a trapezoidal shaped dashed line that encompasses the whole thing. That is, those are the property setbacks. Correct. That's correct. The dotted trapezoidal lines are called the building envelope where he could build inside of mm -hmm. if he wished. Okay, and it's, it's a much larger area than the house that's currently there. There's no house in the bottom lot. Oh, no, no, we're yeah. talking about the top one right now. Oh, yeah, but yes. We'll get to the bottom one. Yes. We'll get there. Okay, so now in terms of the bottom one, so as you said, it's just uh, a property. It's just an envelope. There's correct. no building shown on that whatsoever. Correct. And do you, roughly, do you know the area of that envelope in the lower portion? No. Okay. I can't, I, and I, I'm sure someone could figure it out. I, well, I mean, I, I sat down with my pocket, uh, pocket ruler and drew some triangles and did some measurements, and I came up with uh, between 1,900 and 2,000 square feet. Um, so it's not, you know, and by the time you fit a build, fit a building in there because I mean it's expensive it would be expensive to build something you know that that shape <laughs> that kind of a polygon it would be it would be like the status center of Arlington um, by the time but you're probably talking a property that's a, a house that's you know much smaller um, just out of curiosity I took a bike ride up up there Monday night before town meeting to just you know get an idea of what it looked like um, and to me, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's on a hill, um, but it struck me as, you know, the idea of putting a house there seemed completely, completely reasonable. Um, if that's what ends up happening with, at the moment, we don't know that that will, in fact, happen. Um, the one thing that struck me about the property was, wow, it's got great southern exposure. They could probably do something wicked with solar there. But, yeah, you know, I, I, I like solar, I like earth-covered homes, but... Um, I think this is a very reasonable, I have no issues with someone putting a, putting a house there if they choose to do so, uh, and I support releasing these, pro these, uh, these landlines. Thank you. The gentleman in the center right in the pink shirt.
Brendan Sullivan, Precinct 2. Um, I'm just trying to get an understanding of how we're using this, uh, uh, this new information. And to me, it seems like we're, we're encroaching on, we took this land through basically like imminent domain a long time ago. We have no use for the road and now we're arguing zoning laws basically. Um, it's, it seems to me anyway about whether or not they're allowed to build something on a piece of land that they own. Um, and then also, I just, I'm trying to get an understanding of um, if that's the way we want to use imminent domain is to say, okay, we're not going to use it for its original intended purpose, but now we're going to take it back because we want to create open space. I think that we need a separate procedure for something like that if we're going to take something back the ruminant domain separately to create open space or to say or change the zoning laws if we don't want them to build something on it. Um, so I'm standing in support of the original vote um, and feel like the new information is uh, somewhat irrelevant whether or not he can build a lot. Thank you. Mr. Connors. Okay. Um, Madam Clerk told me it was Mr. Connors, but um, the second row behind Mr. Fisher, I, we miss Mr. Connors. Bill, Bill Kaplan, Precinct 6. Um, I, I, earlier there was a question of, of how we value, how, how can you put a value on, on this, this uh, restriction on the property? And um, I mean, there's, there's probably a lot of ways to do it. Um, one, one thought, uh, I guess it's getting back to this idea that you, you can't build your way out of a financial crisis. Um, at, as we build more houses, we actually generally will be spending more money on uh, services for that household than they're paying in taxes. So if you build a new house and, you know, a family moves in and they're paying 10000 a year in taxes, but they're getting 30,000 a year in services, uh, there's actually a cost to the town of $20,000 a year uh, for that house. And so if you say that we're gonna get paid $28,000 and so that a house can be built and then a family can move in uh, and pay 10,000 a year in taxes, which is, I think, you know, that's higher than the average taxes. Well, well, the question is how do you value it? And, and so that's my question is, it, if, if we're considering these things, um, the town making $28,000 to release a property that will cost the town $20,000 a year is, isn't really a good investment if you look at it that way. Uh, there are other, I mean, there's other arguments to be made. Uh, the idea of the town, you know, taking away the rights of a, of a citizen is, it, it's not great. Uh, but those rights were taken away, you know, 60 years ago. Uh, that owner's long gone. Uh, the most previous owner sold the property just a year or two ago to a developer who I think saw how we voted two years ago and thought, aha, I see a way to make some money by turning this one lot into two houses. Uh, and so, I mean, I think he's thinking, and he should be, I mean, he's a, that's what he does. He's a developer. He's looking at a way to make a profit. So he came up with a way to make a profit. Uh, I just wonder if we as the town should be thinking in similar terms when we make these decisions. Um, you know, he wants to build two houses and make a nice profit on his investment. Uh, there was no guarantee. I mean, he, he rolled the dice when he bought it because he knew that that restriction was there. So really he was gambling and he probably got a decent price for it because it was a gamble. Uh, so the question is, you know, well, again, it comes down to if we, if we release the property for $28,000, uh, is that in our best interest as a town? Uh, forgetting about open space, but just, uh, that $28,000 will be gone in a year and a half after the house is built and a family moves in. So, and then after that, it's, it's a $20,000 a year cost to us every year. Anyway, that's, I mean, that's one way to look at it. There's other ways to value it. Uh, I just thought no one had brought that up, so it seemed worth mentioning it as a possible thought. Mr. Gilligan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Stephen Gilligan, Precinct 13 and Town Treasurer. Uh, I, I'm gonna reiterate what some other town meeting members have said uh, quite factually. The town does not own the property. 
It's owned by a private property owner. The only interest the town has is in an easement that maybe sometime the town may want to build a road. That easement or that interest was purchased by the town over 65 years ago. The town is now collecting, based on that original fee, time value of money, $28,000 to release an easement that the town really can't control unless it comes to town meeting and says, we want to take this property by eminent domain and oh, by the way, we're going to have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for it. So look at the economy of scale. Also keep in mind what was previously said, the property owner can still build on that property, easement or no easement. The difficulty is in title insurance. It will cost the property owner more money to deal with securing a proper title. It's not insurmountable, but it's a pain in the neck and it's expensive. The town's collecting an additional $28,000 on that property. I don't believe the town should collect a dime the town had its interest for 65 years, and it paid for that interest. Now the property owner wants that interest released because the town has no intention of using that interest whatsoever. I think we've been spinning our wheels here. We should vote positively like we did before and end this article. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gillian. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Okay. Mr. Peluso. Yes, Mr. Peluso. Ted Peluso from Precinct 6. I have a couple of questions. Is this town in the business of selling easements? It doesn't sound logical to me. If the fella has an easement on his property, for 60 years, I don't care how many property owners they're in there, we don't want the easement anymore. So why are we trying to hold them up? It doesn't sound fair. We're not in the business of selling easements, are we? Are we in the business of using easements for zoning? I don't think so, right? So I agree 100% with Mr. Gilligan. You should just let this guy use his property. This is the United States. He has rights. Yes? So I don't know what we're talking about this over and over and over again. There's something really off base here. Mr. Schlickman. He's on the list. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate on all items under this article. We have a motion to terminate debate. All those in favor of terminating debate, please say aye. Aye. Any uh, opposed? We have a unanimous vote. We'll now take a vote on Article 29. Are you ready, Mike? We have a two-thirds majority requirement as per the article, and we have it before, from the Board of Selectmen. What's that? What's that? What's that? Oh, we already terminated debate. We took a voice vote on terminating debate, so the vote right now is on Article 29. All those in favor of Article 29 as proposed by the Board of Selectmen, please uh, vote one. If not, vote two. Yes, Article Vote carries. It passes. So we, it's a vote and I so declare it.
I terminate the debate on Article 29. It brings us back to the budget's Article 35. He stole my pen. <laughs> Mr. O'Connor stole my pen. All right, we're in the middle of the budgets. Um, I believe we had finished the town manager's budget. Oh, I, we're in the middle of the budget, Article 35. I believe we had finished the town manager's budget. And the next budget hold was the uh, treasurer collector. Who wanted to speak about treasurer collector? Ms. LaCourt and then Mr. Jameson. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. Mr. Moderator, you'll have to help me out with scope here. What I wanted to ask is that we have been waiting for many years for the treasurer to replace an outmoded collection system with a new system. My understanding is it's in the capital plan, but I know it's been in the capital plan several times. I'm wondering whether we could prevail upon the treasurer to speak to his plan for finally replacing this collection system, if that seems appropriate under this article. Mr. Gilligan, can you answer her question, please? Yes, Mr. Moderator, I can. Stephen Gilligan, town treasurer. We are replacing the integrated collection systems utilized by the treasurer collector's office for the collection of real estate tax, personal property tax, motor vehicle excise tax, water and sewer utility billing, and parking violation collections and permit um, uh, authorizations. The a purchase order has been issued for the real estate tax module from Tyler Technologies to replace the package with uh, their Munis um, addition. Um, I have to preface that by saying we are also implementing a new accounts receivable package and a new cash management package. Those purchase orders have already been issued. A, an RFP, a request for proposal, is already be, is being issued for uh, motor vehicle excise tax as well as water and sewer utility billing. Uh, the final draft of that is uh, under review as we speak. The parking violation collection and permit authorization system has also been ordered through Cardinal Tracking, which is a core module of the system used by the police department. We are well underway. The plan is that um, all of these new collection systems will be integrated and up and running. We've slipped a little bit, but the plan was by the end of this calendar year. So we will certainly have those applications installed and implemented. There will be transition time and there will be training time involved, but we are more than well underway. Could you speak to whether or not you believe that this will uh, create efficiencies that will save money in your budget? Um, we're expecting that it will create efficiencies. We're expecting or hoping that it may reduce overtime in the long run. We have retained the services of a consultant to look at all the business operations packages. Um, so we are always looking at ways to improve the operations of the treasurer's office. It should be understood that new applications does not necessarily save money in and of itself. It creates efficiencies, but does those efficiencies don't necessarily save money. It depends what other work is put placed on the, uh, the authority of the treasurer's office. Okay. So I can't tell you how much money that may save, okay? but I can tell you that that's the goal. Right. It, it may save money or it may uh, uh, increase your operational capacity. Correct. Correct. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Jamison, did you have a question about the treasurer's budget? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Um, as Mr. Gilligan uh, eloquently uh, characterized, their, the treasurer's office and, um, collects a huge number of different types of bills. Now, I don't know about the rest of the body, but I pay 99% of my bills online. And so and the vast majority of those are electronic fund transfers that I accomplish at no cost. Um, I would, uh, it's about 200,000 of these. I, I went through the financial plan and where the treasurer's office reports all those. And I would be interested in learning when we can anticipate such a system 
uh, coming to Arlington. Mr. Gilligan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Gilligan, Town Treasurer. Um, currently, uh, the, the, there are several methods of uh, taxpayers paying their bills. Uh, they can pay in person, uh, they can pay through the mail, and they can pay online by going to the town's website. There are other methods whereby um, in various industries today, individuals may set up what are, what's often referred to as automatic payment, such that you can go into your financial institution, we'll call it a bank for the moment, and say, I want to pay my real estate tax on such and such a day every year or four times a year. Um, of course, you have to guess at what that amount is because the bills keep changing, if not by pennies, but by a few dollars. That is sort of what we'll call in a forecast or in our long-range planning. But given all the things that I've just described in answering Ms. LaCourt's questions, we've got a full plate at the moment. We have implemented all kinds of new procedures in the office over the years, lockbox, online bill paying, et cetera, uh, new banking services. We just changed our bank uh, over, the, over the past uh, year. So yes, is it on the calendar? Yes. When will it get accommodated? Can't answer the question. There are, we have to do this in concert and, with, and in partnership with the IT department. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Good for the excellent support he's been given the treasurer's office over many a hurdle. Um, but so, we have to take things in stride. And one of the things that we have to take in stride with is each bank or financial institution operates their data transport, their EFT, their ACH transactions slightly differently. So if we implement a plan to allow such a thing as automatic payments, we have to work with multiple banks. There's no one single standard. Are we w moving in that direction? Yes. Will that be done in the next year? No. Okay. And um, the uh, packages, the modules that you discussed uh, with, in response to Ms. LaCourt's question, um, I would like to know whether they are fully compatible with EFT transfers. Uh, they are. Excellent. So I'll look forward to that in the future, and I'll continue to inquire until we reach that threshold. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> of the future, Mr. Gilligan. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Deist? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. I noticed that the position of management analyst in the treasurer's budget, it, the budget drops down to zero and presumably the position goes away. Uh, what's going on and who will pick up the duties of that position? Mr. Gilligan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Gilligan, Town Treasurer. I'm, I'm hoping this mic works a little better. Uh, you're correct. The management analyst position has is, is been uh, rated as zero. We have eliminated the position. Um, I continually look at the operations of the office and the organizational resource required to meet the treasurer and collector's operations. Uh, I will state personally, I am, um, I'll use the word saddened to see that position uh, go. However, uh, in conversations I've had with the town manager and uh, looking to meet the needs of the treasurer collector's office, as well as in supporting the entire town and its operations. Uh, one of the things I learned at AT&T is sometimes you have to give up some things uh, to make the whole team work a little better. So in my discussions with the town manager, he expressed to me uh, that there were other needs that the town needed to fund. Was there a way that I could build a better mousetrap and still meet the ever-increasing workload that's being placed on my office. Um, I agreed to uh, eliminate that position, restructure, create a new position called Principal Clerk and Assistant Cashier to help us with the, with the workload in the, what I'll call the front office. And um, as you may have read in, my, in the annual report section of the town's annual report, uh, by doing that, I've saved $45,000 this current fiscal year, that money's being turned over to the town manager, and the savings will be $30,000 per year going forward. And the town manager will be using those funds to support increased uh, police services and law enforcement uh, in the community. Thank you, very informative. Thanks for running a tight ship in your office, and thanks for cooperating with the manager. You're welcome. Anyone else wish to discuss the treasurer's budget? Okay, seeing none, the next budget on hold was
Board of Assessors. Who wanted to discuss the Board of Assessors? Nobody. Okay. Next budget held was who? They do? No. Sorry. <laughs> Zoning Board of Appeals, someone put a hold on ZBA. Who wants to talk about that? Mr. Klein. He's talking about his own board. Christian Klein, Precinct 10, member of the Arlington ZBA. Um, there were a lot of discussions this year in regards to zoning articles and putting things into the special permit category out of the general permit category. Um, I would just request in future years if that is an intention that our budget be looked at uh, we currently have one part-time clerical position. Um, Ashley does a tremendous amount of work for us on a part-time salary, but if we triple her workload, um, we're going to need more people. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, the next public works. Who wanted to discuss public works? Mr. Trembley. And then Mr. Uh, Ed Trumbly, Precinct 19. Mr. Moderator, uh, could, could anybody tell me how much salt we use this year? <laughs> I don't use salt anymore. My doctor said it's bad for my heart. Uh, Mr. Yeah, it's, it's also bad for our cars and storm drains and all kinds of stuff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, this year we used approximately uh, 57 5,700 tons of salt, plus or minus a few pounds, uh, at a cost of about $490,000. Ooh, that's a significant amount less than we've ever used, isn't it? Uh, it was a, a considerably milder winter this year. It, it was, yes. Um, and I had one other question for the... Uh, for the yeah, uh, go ahead and ask. The, I'm sorry? Yeah, go ahead and ask. Um, I was kind of, kind of curious what's happening with Gray Street. Uh, I think that's tops my list as the worst street in town now, or at oh, least the Academy? worst major street. I'm just curious what's happening with that. Academy and Gray. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Mr. Street is pretty bad, too. I, I agree. Uh, thank you, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, you may have uh, some challenges on the worst street in town designation <laughs> yeah. for that particular road. Uh, but it is on our short list of roads that, that need work. It, it isn't on this year's paving program to be completely resurfaced. We do expect to make um, spot improvements to that road. We are also looking to seek uh, or to see if Gray Street would qualify for complete streets funding, which the town recently adopted a complete streets policy, which requires us to um, revitalize sidewalks and, and intersections at the same time as doing paving projects. And, and Gray Street um, may be a good candidate for that funding, and we will be pursuing that for next year. But does that mean we get bike lanes too? Uh, uh, Gray Street is not on, the, on a, a matrix of uh, roadways in town that we had considered for uh, bike, oh. bike lanes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Fiore? <clears throat> Peter Fiore, Precinct 2. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I have... Uh, two questions, one sidewalk repair, the other street repair. Uh, today, I was going to work, and the town's down on Little John repairing the sidewalks, and I think they're doing a good job. And then when I walk up Mott Street, uh, where six houses have been torn down and rebuilt uh, over the past several years, um, two of them even now under construction, I, I look at the work that the developer's doing, rebuilding the sidewalks that, that he's destroyed with this heavy equipment, with the teardowns and rebuilds, and it, it doesn't look like the same kind of quality work I see the town employees doing. So I'm just wondering if I'm right, who signs off on the developer's work after they've torn up a good town sidewalk and, and they've rebuilt it? Uh, who, who sees that they're doing it up to standards or, and that the taxpayers in this town aren't gonna have to go in and rebuild it in a couple of years? So there is a question. Can you answer there. his question? Uh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, sidewalk construction is required to take a permit with the Public Works Department, Engineering Department. 
and uh, those permits are reviewed and the work is reviewed uh, after completion. Uh, I can have someone go down to Little John in particular to look at that work, but we do review No, those. no, not Little John. The, the town's oh, working on Little oh, John. It's the the work on Mott Street. Sorry, I, I probably didn't say that. We can have someone go down and take a look at that in particular. So then my street question is Mott Street. Uh, because of these six teardowns and rebuilds, and I haven't looked on Dorothy Road where there's, I think it's half a dozen homes that have been torn down and rebuilt there as well. That, so I, on Mott Street, because of the six homes that have been torn down and rebuilt and Dorothy Road in the same block section between Parker and Little John, there's another half dozen. I haven't really looked at Dorothy closely. But on Mott Street where these six houses have been torn down and rebuilt, the heavy equipment that's gone up and down the road, the debris haulers, the backhoes, the tractor trailer delivery trucks, the, uh, the cement mixers. Uh, the street's been cut into, and you can go see for yourself, anybody, 20 times. And uh, I can see where some of these patches, they're concave, the street's broken up, it's, uh, it's sunken. And, and so anyway, it's, it's not in good shape anymore, although it's not grossly deteriorated. So my question is, the developer, and I'm not going to mention any names, but it seems to me there's a single developer. Will that developer be required to rebuild, recrown, resurface that section of street that's pretty beat up? We do um, require, well, any trench in town is the, uh, the maintenance of it is owned by the utility or the contractor that caused the trench to be created uh, for the life of that roadway. And, and the town and the engineering department does review trench permits on an annual basis to identify if trench, trenches need to be repaired. Uh, we do a case-by-case -case basis when a contractor takes out a permit if they're going to be replacing sewer, water, and, uh, and, and, and other utilities in a close proximity. We do put a contingent on that they resurface the entire stretch of road in front of that project. If it's just one utility or another, they're just required to pair that trench. Um, so. But to answer your question, we do review those permits and, and we will be back in, on those areas to make sure that the trenches are holding up. So when you say the trenches, and I, I don't, I'm not, obviously I'm not an expert on macadam or recon, street constructioner. The, the, the trenches you're talking to are the, are the cuts that I'm talking about where they've cut in for utilities, I suppose gas, sewer, water. I, I just, Correct. maybe you might go down and look. I, this isn't really a complaint. It's not a complaint against the DPW, but like I say, this, this development, these half a dozen homes, that street might need to be redone, that section of, I don't know, 50 yards in its entirety. Uh, and, and I just, again, I, I guess the taxpayers will have to do it as opposed to the developer. But. That, well, that's not necessarily true. I, I'd have to look. I don't know off the top of my head what exact permits were issued for that project, yeah. but. Um, depending on the amount of utility work that was required for those mm -hmm. buildings, we may have put a, a contingent on the permit mm -hmm. that they patch a, a larger section of road than just the trench itself. So mm -hmm. I will review that okay. and, um, and look to see what All we right. have there. Great, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Fiore. Um, Mr. Koch? Kevin Koch, Precinct 16. So we have a lot of LED streetlights in town, which are fairly new, and I'm surprised that I see lots of the little dots are like broken, and the streetlights are progressively failing, and I'm wondering what recourse the town has in that regard. Mr. Rademacher? Oh, oh Mr. Chaplain. Adam Chapteling, town manager. Uh, the first round of LED streetlights that we purchased, um, I guess it would be five years ago now, I have a seven-year warranty uh, with uh, what is now uh, Siemens, who we have um, both a maintenance contract with and hold the warranty. So if they're broken and reported to DPW, we report it to Siemens, and they come out and replace it at their expense. Uh, the second round of streetlights that we purchased, um, I want to say four years ago now, have a 10-year warranty. So during that first seven and then a second 10-year warranty period, uh, they are fully warrantied, both the actual parts and the installation. Uh, after that, if there you know, is continuing failing, it will be on the, on the town, but right now they're all still under warranty. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Radosha. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bob Radosha, Precinct 11. <clears throat> it seems Mystic Street between Medford Street and Summer Street has been in a state of turmoil for the past three or four years. There's been a lot going on down there. And we were, we, the people I talked to, in fact, tonight, as I was walking my dog, I was verbally abused by one of my neighbors about when are we going to do something about that. And <clears throat> so I'd like to report back to my constituents and others that complain about it all the time as to when we might see that get repaid. We were under the impression it was going to happen last November, but that didn't happen. So. Uh, Uh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, that, it is slated to be paved this year. Um, we've had a string of one utility after the next doing their work in that road, the gas company, electric company, and, and we did some water work there. All that work is now complete, and we, it is in our plan to pave this year. This year, not soon, but sometime. This summer, this, this, constru summer. this construction season. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Anything else in Public Works? Oh, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. David Watson, Precinct 5. Uh, just had a question in the properties and natural resources section of the budget on the expense line. Uh, there's a 41% increase there, uh, about $116,000, and I just wanted to ask uh, where that was coming from. Mr. Rademacher. Thank you, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. The increase in that line is to assist with uh, tree-related maintenance and care. Um, we have a significant backlog of tree work, and we uh, hope to use those funds to get some contracted help. Great. Thank you. Mr. Fisher. Uh, I guess I'm assuming that the water bill is under Public Works. Uh, I just wanted to say we had a $900 water bill for the summer watering season and uh, we were hoping that this, the powers that be were going to cause your summer bill to be an average of the winter bill. At any rate, I, I wish that some adjustment could be made for water use that doesn't use the sewage. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else on public works? Seeing none, <clears throat> the next budget that was held was facilities. Mr. Leonard, then Ms. LaCourt. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. Mr. Moderator, I wonder on the facilities if somebody could explain to me while the director of facilities is getting a raise of over $70,000 to the tune of 137% this year. Mr. Chapdelaine. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, though I think the director would very much like that raise. Uh, it's not, in fact, a raise. Uh, last year, the way it was budgeted was half of the salary was budgeted in the town budget, half was budgeted in the school department budget. This year, uh, the salary is budgeted in full in the town budget, but the school department's contribution is included as an offset uh, below the actual appropriation amounts. Could we have that a little bit clearer, please? Because uh, as I read it in the book, reading all the other assessments, it's saying it's going from 51 to $122,000 for an individual. Um, Adam Chaplain, town manager, there's actually a footnote that describes what I just described in that the facilities department was created in FY16. The director, energy manager, and administrative assistant were funded 50% in the school budget in FY16 and 50% through a transfer of funds in FY17. So I, I, I guess we could talk with the finance committee about a clear depiction, but the footnote certainly describes the changes between 16 and 17. So the guy's getting the same amount of money, which is funding it through two different budgets last year, and this year it's in one budget. 
I'm getting a head nod, yes. Yes, okay. Is that clear, Mr. Leonard? Not really, Ms. Moderator. <laughs> ah. So last year, the school paid half his salary and the town paid half. This year, the town's paying the entire bud salary. Which is 122? Looks that way. Is it 122, Mr. Chapterlane? Adam Chapterlane, town manager. The director of facilities is a her, um, Ruthie Bennett, not, not, not a he. Uh, and uh, so last year, I guess I apologize for any lack of clarity. We had a budgeted amount before we had anybody hired, uh, and after going through um, the recruitment and interview process, settled on a contractual amount. So it's not representative of 50-50, but uh, 17 is the amount um, that we actually hired the director at. Mr. Moderator, is it my understanding that you can make an amendment or ask something to be amended under these budgets, such as a salary for an individual? You can amend a budget, but we have to maintain a balanced budget overall. So I would, it would not be possible to ask for a figure for an individual to be amended. Mr. Heim, what do you think? <laughs> Who is it? Doug Heim, <clears throat> Doug Heim, Town Council. So, uh, town meeting uh, can. Uh, appropriate a bottom line number for a department, but it would exceed town meeting's authority to negotiate or try to negotiate a specific salary for an individual employee. Um, that's vest. Sorry. Town meeting can uh, give a bottom line number for uh, a budget, but it can't negotiate a salary for an individual employee. So it would be outside the scope of town meeting's power to essentially say, we're assigning this specific salary number to an employee uh, that the town manager and others or others had negotiated with. Is that, does that answer your question, Mr. Leonard? It does, it does. Mr. Moderator, I'll just end by saying, going through the book, there's roughly nine other let's call them directors and other departments, all seeking raises which they are probably entitled to, but none of the other nine come anywhere near to the amount of money that looks like it's going to this particular director. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else on facilities? Ms. LaCourt, did you want to speak to it? Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. I have two questions relative to the facilities budget. Um, one thing that I would like to do is that the facilities budget is new and this is a new department. And I wonder whether either the director of facilities or the town manager wants to speak to how well the facilities department is going and um, particularly in light of our concerns about uh, the long-term maintenance in buildings that we're now renovating or have renovated in the past and our assumption that um, creating this department would help us to extend the lives of those buildings. Mr. Chapdelaine. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, I'll, I'll take a crack and then I'd actually I'd ask if the director of facilities could add to what uh, I said, please. Mr. Moderator. Sure. Uh, I, I think um, out of the gates in the past year, we, we've, we've, done, we've done very well. Um, the department has implemented uh, a work order system that has inventoried all of the, uh, the systems in the town that allow all departments to uh, make maintenance requests or repair requests so that it's all uh, documented and tracked and the, and the workload can be managed much more effectively than it had been done in the past. Uh, also, the director is now sitting at the Permanent Town Building Committee, uh, so this facilities department is having a strong voice in the development of all design for all buildings that we have going forward, so we're putting in uh, we're putting in HVAC systems that are in coordination with what we have in place. We're putting in energy management systems that are in coordination mm -hmm. with what we have putting in place. So I think we've taken very good strides in the first year of starting to coordinate and manage um, our maintenance and our uh, construction of, of new buildings. 
Excellent. Um, did the facilities director wanted to add to that or? Sure. Come on up and give us your um, two cents worth on your department. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ruthie Bennett, Director of Facilities. We're doing actually two other things. We've created a preventive maintenance um, software module. So we're taking all the pieces of equipment, the roofs, the windows, all the envelope, putting it into um, a software program so that every year or every number of years, everything that needs to be maintained on a preventive uh, schedule comes up automatically as a work order consistent with the work order system that we've created. The other thing we're working on is a 20-year capital forecast. Mm -hmm. Again, trying to understand uh, the new and the old buildings, what they need on a rolling basis, looking out 20 years. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask another question that you might want to hang around for. Um, it, well, uh, assuming it's all right with the moderator. Um, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about energy management, and particularly the school energy offset and um, the, the uh, uh, savings that our energy manager has been finding for us, et cetera, just in general, I'd like to call this out for folks. The energy manager position and the school offset on energy management. Ms. Bennett. Ruthie Bennett, Director of Facilities. I'm not sure what you mean by school offset. I can talk about energy management. Here, here in the budget, there's a line that says school energy offset, $130,000. Uh, yeah, I see that. <coughs> Mr. Chapdelin, can you explain what that is? Adam Chapdelin, town manager. That's listed as school energy offset, uh, and I apologize for not noticing that before you ask me. That's actually the school department funding half of the director's position. Okay. The energy manager's position and the administrative assistance position. Okay. So that's the school offset. All right. uh, it's not just, it was last year just the school okay. energy offset. It's no longer just that. All right. But I know that we put solar panels on the roofs of a bunch of buildings, and I'm wondering how that's going in terms of savings and efficiency and whether we're looking to do more. Um, so Ruthie Bennett, Director of Facilities, um, we did put solar panels on six of our schools. Um, in this weather, they're producing uh, incredible amounts of clean energy. We're very excited about that. We have thought about possibly putting them at the DPW. That's mm -hmm. under design and, and conceptual now, mm -hmm. so uh, we're not sure about that. Mm -hmm. We also have, I think you mentioned energy management systems, yes. yeah. which we have now in roughly 10 buildings in mm -hmm. town. Um, and I can go into this in a much deeper level uh, another time, but they are yeah. definitely helping us manage uh, our HVAC runtime and not cooling and heating at the same time. We're seeing everything online. We can fix a lot of it online. We know what we're looking for. So we're really managing the consumption of the energy much tighter than we've done before and also remotely. So we don't always have to run to the school to, to, fix to do it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Memon. Mr. Koch. Kevin Koch, Precinct 16. With regard to the solar panels, how much of the, or how much, we heard that they, we have them. Uh, I, I thought part of the question was, how much are we saving with them? And I didn't hear an answer to that. Are we saving any money, Ms. Bennett? Ruthie Bennett, Director of Facilities. We are estimated to save $80,000 a year on the solar panels. Wow. That depends on how much sun we have, but that's a general estimate of a per year savings from all six schools. Wow, Ms. Mayor. 80,000, a lot of money. Leslie Mayor, Precinct 21. It sounds like the new facilities department is well on its way to um, helping address the maintenance needs of our buildings. Last year I asked about our outdoor assets and our outdoor facilities and what plans we had for looking at the maintenance requirements there. I'm wondering whether we've made any progress at coming up with a plan for how we're going to address those needs. Is outdoors under your jurisdiction, Ms. Bennett? No. Mr. Chapdelaine. Adam Chapdelin, town manager. Uh, we, we've certainly been focused on facilities as they're defined by you know, 
four walls as they'd be. Uh, I, I think we still have work to do in outlining, you know, it's, as you know, it's a shared responsibility between uh, the Recreation Department uh, under Joe Connolly as well as the staff of DPW, uh, but we, we sort of have this ongoing conversation about how we can better, uh, I guess you could call it, a, put together a preventative maintenance program for our outdoor facilities. As well as the schools. The schools are also yeah, no, in that mix. I so fair. I know that last year we talked about getting something together to start to look at those needs and how we address them. And I'm just hoping that we haven't left them completely behind. Yeah, I, I, w I would, I mean, we actually had a meeting this week with the superintendent specifically about um, the, the high school athletic facilities and how they should be managed. So it's certainly on the radar, but they fully admit there's more work to do. Thank you. Anyone else on facilities? Seeing none, the community safety was next. Who wanted to discuss community safety? Mr. Schlickman. And then Mr. Fiore. Paul Schleckman, Precinct 9. How much salt? No. Um, <laughs> I see we are maintaining just one full-time and two part-time parking control officers in our densely populated municipality that has more illegally parked cars than parking tickets. My question is, given that the parking study is resulting in new regulations in the center and that enforcement would be a cornerstone of making it work, wouldn't it be logical that we would need to increase the number of parking control officers, a position that would seem to generate revenue for the town rather than cost revenue? Chief? Oh, Mr. Chapdelaine? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, so Mr. Schlickman is referring to the uh, Arlington Center Parking Management Plan. We have um, five new. One is an additional uh, meter in both the Russell Common lot and the Water Street lot. And we are moving forward with putting on-street meters uh, sometime within the next six months in Arlington Center. Um, what I would say is they, these parking control officers still will have the same amount of ground to cover, same amount of spots to manage as they currently do. Uh, so it's not immediately apparent to me that we need to increase um, increase the workforce. Also, the meter technology that we'll be installing will be smart technology that will be able to inform parking control officers of where violations are occurring. Uh, I'm not opposed to uh, increasing staff if it so calls for it, but I'd prefer to have the meters installed, see how the current staffing level is working out before making a recommendation to town meeting of increasing staffing. I, I would just think that given the ratio of illegally parked cars to parking tickets, in this municipality that our parking signs are often viewed as suggestions and not regulations and that more enforcement agents would both bring folks into compliance and generate a little more revenue for the town. Thank you. Mr. Fiore? I don't know about that, Paul. My dad got a ticket in the rain while he was at church. <laughs> no, <laughs> he should have been. He might not have gotten a ticket. Peter Fiore, Precinct 2. Uh, Mr. Moderator, since all politics is local, I'm going back to Mott Street. Uh, <laughs> one of the houses, the six houses that was torn down, uh, there was a, this was a, three years ago when it became the nonstop construction zone that it is, uh, there was a firefighter on duty um, and I called the fire, fire department and they told me he was there to, to suppress uh, to dust, which I can understand. So I, I don't know that I saw a firefighter on duty for these other teardowns on Mott Street or Dorothy Road, and, and I may have missed it because they demolished these houses pretty quickly. And so I'm wondering, is, is there a requirement for public safety that a developer, when he's tearing down a house, has a firefighter on, on duty uh, with, with a hose attached to the hydrant in case of an emergency? Is that, is that a requirement? Chief Jefferson? Uh, Bob Jefferson, Fire Chief. Uh, there is a regulation that's actually governed by the Board of Health that whenever there is a demolition, a um, firefighter is hired to be there with the hose off the hydrant to control the dust as the demolition of the building is occurring and as the debris is being hauled away. They have to come in, they have to get demolition permits from the building department, and then they have to go through the police, fire, Board of Health, get all their sign-offs. When they come in, we inform them that they need to have a demolition and they need to contact us. Uh, so there's kind of a checks and balance between the uh, building department, the Board of Health, and everybody telling us 
that it needs to be done and then the contract has to contact us. Mostly all those houses, if, they, if not all, did have uh, fire control, uh, dust control down there. So I'm, I'm sorry, you said most of them, but, but not all of them? Well, they, they should, any, any demolition yeah. should have it. Um, again, they have to apply for demolition permits, that's when we find out about it and that's when we notify the contractor or the owner of that property that they're gonna have to hire a firefighter to do that dust control for them. Okay, I, I think that's great. And so now, uh, Mr. Fisher's question about his $900 water bill, does the developer pay for the water that comes out of the hydrant to yes, do Yes, they do. We actually put a, uh, a standard fee of $50 on there, um, which is well above what it would be. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a meter to meter what we're taking off the hydrant. We discussed it with the water department, uh, as well as charging them for the firefighter that's there to do the detail. We charge them a $50 flat fee for the water, and that's uh, returned back to the water department. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. Now I'm going to beat up Chief Ryan. Uh, this nonstop construction zone, this isn't your neighbor's addition or remodeling. You know, three houses were demolished at once. Two of them are still under construction. Heavy equipment comes and goes, debris haulers, cement mixers, tract flatbed tractor trailer delivery trucks, uh, backhoes with metal treads. And, uh, and even now, you know, this, this little bobcat, I was walking up the street because you can't, well, you can walk on the sidewalk now, but I had to walk on the street and this bobcat darts out from between the parked contractor's cars and fortunately one of the other guys worked and stopped him from running me over. So my question is, uh, I called the police when the first house came down because the developer put up a sign that said street closed, police officer head. Well, having walked up the street not seeing the police officer, I called the police and said, Why, where's the detail? And the response is, there's no detail. So the police came down and the sign came down. And, and they said that uh, you can't, you can't, they can't require a police officer to be on duty no matter what's, what's going on for construction. So my question, Chief, is why, what, what would it take to have a police officer, uh, officer assigned to these days when there are, there is heavy equipment uh, coming and going, debris haulers back in the wrong way up a one-way street, uh, and, and cement mixers and everything else, what, what would it take to require them to hire police detail for public safety the way they have to hire a firefighter? Chief Ryan? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Frederick Ryan, Chief of Police. Uh, the bottom line is public safety. You know, we, we don't require details to create an income for police officers or uh, uh, for any other reason but public safety. So if it's on a secondary road where um, uh, traffic uh, signs and cones will suffice, then we don't require the presence of a police officer. Now, if, if you're suggesting that uh, public safety was at risk, we're happy to visit that site and uh, have a conversation with the uh, contractor overseeing the site, but the bottom line is public safety. And if, there's, if safety is at risk, then we will take action. If it's just a, a matter of, of setting up traffic control devices that, that will uh, remedy the uh, safety concern, we do that. So I'm not, I'm not familiar with the situation you're speaking of. But. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sirs. Mr. Trembley. Mitch Rumbley, Precinct 19. I understand the town is trying to promote uh, business in the uh, center and like that. You know, there's nothing that says shop here like parking tickets. <laughs> Mr. Fisher. Um, Andrew Fisher, uh, Precinct 6. Um, I feel that what I'm going to raise is is within the scope because some efforts of efficiency um, ought to be discussed townwide and decided townwide. And I'm talking about the new app by which people are able to take photographs of other people in the park if their dog is off leash. And I, I don't want to discuss dogs at all. It's just that this is such a departure. Um, other examples might be too inflammatory, but I'd be equally horrified if someone wanted to have 
camping permits and encouraged photographs of people camping out. Or if people w were fanatic about, I don't know if they're fanatic, but were really, really serious about open meeting laws and had an app that would take photographs of three or more selectmen or school committee members. And uh, if their lips are moving, take video. Thank you for laughing. I've been searching for examples that would, you know, so or littering or so on. So I, I feel if we're going to go down this road, um, the selectmen ought to be involved in setting policy and, and supporting the decision. Uh, all due respect, I know it's frustrating um, what goes on in the park. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else on community safety? Ma'am. Thank you, Betty Stone, Precinct 7. Um, I, I would like to ask for um, an explanation from, in terms of both police services and fire services, about the, how you use overtime versus um, hiring more firefighters and police officers. Uh, and I know that that's probably is or possibly connected to unions and other things, but in both services, the overtime lines are quite high. In the police department, the police services, it's... Um, First, we'll have Mr. Jeff Chief Jefferson answer, and then we'll have Mr. Ryan give so you the answer. Bob Jefferson, Fire Chief. I'll be happy to answer for Fred. May not be right. Um, overtime... <clears throat> is based on whether we have minimum manning and how many people are on a shift. When people retire, it takes a long process to refill those positions. At times, I know my department, I know the police department is very similar, we'll run anywhere from four to 10 vacancies because it takes that long to replace those bodies. Interview process, all that, against the academy, anywhere from nine months to a year to replace those bodies. Most of our overtime is incurred when there are vacancies uh, within the department, and then we have to backfill. Now, mm -hmm. some of that backfill will be covered by those vacancies, but naturally you're paying out a higher premium for the overtime. So it's not as though we have overtime there um, just for the sake of, of, of filling it. It's more um, when we hit minimum manning, uh, you know, they're entitled to so many days off, so much vacation time, so much holiday. Um, it really comes down to when we have vacancies or if someone's out on extended injury leave or extended sick leave, we have to backfill. Um, we don't use it to say, okay, it's cheaper to use overtime because then you don't have to pay benefits. It's just a matter of trying to get people back into the buildings. Chief Ryan, are you use essentially the same process? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Yeah, uh, Chief Ryan, uh, Arlington Police Department. Yes, and I would just remind town meeting, once upon a time we had many more police officers that didn't require um, every time an officer took a vacation day to backfill with overtime. So when we, we reduce the number of sworn police officers, that drives up the need to fund overtime. Basically, every time a police officer takes a vacation day or, or a personal day, it requires a backfill in overtime. That wasn't the case many years ago. Thank you. Anything else on community safety? Okay, seeing none. We'll Got a motion to adjourn. We'll take up with inspections number 20 when we come back. All in favor of adjournment, please say yes. yes. Opposed? We're so adjourned. Any motions for reconsideration? Seeing none, thank you very much.